He is the most notorious killer in Southeast Asian history. He was hypnotic, very intelligent, and absolutely ruthless. A career criminal who freely admitted to a string of shocking murders. They were absolutely brutal. It's very horrific. Almost jokingly, he, would exp he was talking about how he splashed petrol onto the body. He preyed on those in search of adventure. He had been leaving this trail of corpses along the hippie trail. He was uh, masterful at covering his tracks. A con man, escape artist, thief, and killer who earned the name The Serpent. October 18, 1975, Thailand. Along a scenic stretch of sand called Pattaya Beach, 93 miles southeast of Bangkok, a local fisherman makes a shocking discovery. Here, in the shallow waters of a tidal pool, he finds the lifeless body of a young woman wearing only a flowered bikini. Authorities detect no sign of injury. They assume the woman is a Western traveler who, like so many others, sampled the local hashish and deer, only to overdose and drown. She remains unidentified and is buried in an unmarked grave. The body is found in a region near the so-called Hippie Trail, a popular route for Westerners traveling across Europe and Southeast Asia in the 1960s and 70s. The trail winds its way across Europe the Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia, leading to the holy city of Kathmandu, Nepal, high in the Himalayas. Most travelers on the trail live on limited budgets and experiment with drugs. Many are idealistic in search of spiritual enlightenment. A lot of the backpackers were living from hand to mouth. They didn't ask a lot of hard questions. As a traveler, you would tend to become instant friends with people, you know, af after a day or two. In 1975, one of these travelers is 18-year-old Teresa Knowlton, an American from Seattle, Washington. Like so many others, she travels to Asia in search of spiritual growth. As she started studying uh, the different religions and, like I said, became interested in uh, uh, Buddhism, she was very fascinated uh, by the monks, the Buddhist monks. She was actually on the way to a monastery in Kathmandu, a Tibetan monastery, but she stopped off in Thailand first, maybe to have a bit of On previous trips, Teresa would write home often, but this time, her family heard nothing for months. They reach out to US officials overseas for help. My mom sending letters and phone calls to the State Department and her wild thoughts about this, this tragedy that had to have befallen her. And I was just thinking my mom is being dramatic. More than seven months after Teresa first set off on her journey, her family gets terrible news from Thai authorities. My mom had gotten a phone call or a letter or something stating that they believed that they had the body of my, my, my niece and that they needed to send pictures the pictures confirm her family's worst fears. Authorities in Thailand now perform an autopsy on Teresa Knowlton. They determined that she did not drown accidentally. She was murdered. They determined that she, in fact, had been strangled before she died. Investigators have no suspects. Since it has taken seven months to identify Teresa's body, the trail of evidence has gone cold. Teresa Knowlton's murder uh, investigation was hampered by the fact that it was not immediately identified as a murder investigation. November 28, 1975. A month after the discovery of Teresa Knowlton's body, there is another murder, this one more grisly. A traveler on the road to Pattaya Beach finds the badly beaten and charred body of a young man. He'd been drenched with gasoline and set ablaze. The victim is identified as Vitali Hakim from Istanbul, Turkey. Thai investigators are horrified when they discover Hakim was still alive when someone set fire to his body.
December 16, 1975. Two weeks after the delivery of Vitali's body, bodies of a young Dutch couple are found in a ditch, 55 miles north of Bangkok. They are identified as 29-year-old Henk Betania and his 25-year-old fiance, Cornelia Hemker. They, too, had been badly beaten and burned alive. News of the gruesome murders hits the papers on the same day as another disturbing discovery. Once again, another body is found just south of Pattaya Beach. This time, the victim is a 24-year-old French woman named Stephanie Pari. Investigators learn that she came to the area looking for her Turkish boyfriend, Vitali Hakim. Like Teresa Knowlton, Pari is found in the water. She had been strangled so violently her neck was broken. Unlike Teresa, she is wearing a dress, not a bikini. Still, the media jump on the story, labeling the two murders as the bikini killings. Just days after the discovery of Stephanie Pari's body, another murder investigation begins to unfold. 1,300 miles away, where the hippie trail winds through Kathmandu, Nepal. Here, investigators are horrified by the discovery of two victims who had been murdered and set ablaze. On December 21st, the charred remains of a man are found on the outskirts of the city. A day later, police find the body of a woman in a field. She was stabbed. Uh, stabbed, and after then, she was, the, the, the body was the bond. But actually, it is the horrible and uh, it's the brutal uh, type of the killing. Nepalese police canvass the area, looking for witnesses who might be able to help identify the victims. We started to search the hotels, lodges, private houses, everywhere. Just so we know these are the foreigners, maybe Europeans, Americans, with the size of the body and the color of the skin. Authorities soon identified the victims, as 26-year-old Canadian Laurent Ormond Carrier and his companion, 29-year-old American Connie Jo Bronzich. Over the next few months, news of the Hippie Trail murders begin sweeping across Europe, Asia, and the U.S. In each case, the murder victims' money and passports are stolen. Because the crimes occurred in separate countries, authorities are at a disadvantage. More than six months after the murders in Nepal, there is a major break in the case in India. Police arrest this man, 32-year-old Charles Sobraj. When investigators take a closer look at Sobraj, they find evidence linking him to a gruesome trail of crime. Underneath a charming exterior, they discover a man capable of monstrous acts, a man who would earn the nickname The Serpent. The arrest occurs in New Delhi, India, here at the Vikram Hotel, when a group of French students begin passing out after taking anti-dysentery pills given to them by their tour guide. Police arrest the tour guide along with three female accomplices. Two women quickly confess and make some startling revelations. They tell police the tour guide is a con artist, thief, and murderer named Charles Sobraj. They confess to helping Sobraj drug and poison people on the hippie trail so they could steal their money and passports. Some poisonings, they say, ended in murder. Police investigating Sobraj recover the passports and personal items of some of the murdered victims. As Indian investigators delve into Sobraj's past, they discover he is suspected of crimes in several other countries. There were a number of investigations in which he was involved. These ranged from thefts to international uh, uh, misuse of uh, travel documents such as passports. Based on this information, Indian authorities charged Sobraj with the recent murder of a French tourist named Luc Solomon. While awaiting trial, Officials allow Sobraj to do a series of audio-taped interviews with Australian writer Richard Neville. These photographs were taken my, during my interviews with Charles Sobraj. As Neville begins listening to Charles Sobraj, he is stunned by what he hears. 
a full confession with all the grisly details. It was the gradual unfolding of his confession to me that became more and more terrifying. The first person Charles Sobrage admitted to me that he had actually murdered was Teresa Knowlton, who planned to study Tibetan Buddhism at a monastery. In the audio tapes, Sobraj tells Neville he met Teresa Knowlton at a resort near Pattaya Beach in southern Thailand. Sobraj explains that at the time he was working a con, posing as a French gem dealer. He invited Teresa to join him and an accomplice at a club on the beach. There, they dropped a sedative called Magadon into her coffee. She said, did you give me something? Because I feel very funny. So Braj claimed that they then drove to the beach where he and his accomplice dressed Teresa in a bikini. He then ordered his cohort to lead her to deep water where she drowned. So Braj's stated motive for the murder a deep hatred for Westerners and drug users. I think Teresa represented everything Charles Sobraj despised. Teresa had come out of the 1960s and early 70s counterculture. She was sexually liberated, was spiritually focused. Sobraj believed Teresa was also a drug dealer. He would say that all the people he killed deserved it because they were running heroin. Well, that was not true. In some cases, including Teresa Knowlton, I certainly think that the evidence lies on the fact that she was innocent. As authorities in several countries begin investigating Sobraj, they want to know how he had managed to evade the law so easily and what fueled his intense hatred for Westerners. Charles Sobraj was born on April 6, 1944, in French-occupied Saigon, Vietnam. He was born of a Vietnamese mother in Saigon to a, uh, uh, an Indian father. Charles Sobraj had a very uh, transient lifestyle as a child growing up. His parents' relationship was volatile. They separated when Charles was just three years old. His mother then married a French lieutenant, moved to Marseille, France, and started a new family. Charles was left with his wealthy father, who also married and had more children. When his mother returned to Vietnam four years later, she found that young Charles was often neglected. He'd lived on his wits in the streets of Asia. His early years were appalling. His mother took him back to Marseille, but Charles never bonded with his new family in France and was angry with his father for letting him go. Charles longed for the life he remembered in Vietnam. Charles committed his first crime as a young boy stealing from a local shopkeeper. It was the first of many petty crimes. His mother responded to these exploits with severe punishment. Sabraj himself was really badly treated by his mother. From a very early age, uh, he had a sense of abandonment. Um, he was waiting a his bed up until the age of 15. One of the, the ways his mother tried to uh, attack that problem was to tie up his penis with string. That stamped a sort of kind of hardness in his soul. Charles' feelings of anger and abandonment intensified when he was nine. His mother and stepfather left him in a boarding school in Paris while they returned to Vietnam. So he spent all his holidays alone in a boarding school, often throwing him in, himself into the bed and weeping. At age 16, his father allowed him to move back to Vietnam to live with him. The move did not help his son's behavior. Charles continued to lie and steal. Within two years, his father sent him back to Paris. He was uh, cast out. His father really never accepted him as his own. In France, Charles was arrested when he was 19 for burglary and received a three-year sentence. Alone in his cell, Sobraj read books on law and psychology. 
He also honed an aptitude for foreign languages. Charles Abraj was capable of so much. He had so much intrinsic capacity and talent. So Braj was released from prison at the age of 22. Soon he met a young, beautiful Parisian woman from a wealthy family named Chantal. He was eager to impress her with his literary knowledge, good looks, and engaging personality. What was scary about him was that he had a certain charm to him. Apparently was able to, you know, befriend uh, women quite, quite easily. Chantal quickly fell in love with the handsome, charismatic Sobrage. But during their courtship, he couldn't compete with her wealthy lifestyle. He began committing burglaries and robberies, going so far as to steal a car, which landed him back in jail. Still, Sobrage convinced Chantal they were meant for each other. She waited for him, and they got married five months after he was released from prison. Almost immediately, Chantal became pregnant. So Braj tried to go straight. He worked in a restaurant, but it did not pay well. And so Braj thought the work was beneath him. He began passing bad checks to help pay for the luxuries he craved. So at first, Charles Braj's motivation was really to survive. Then it came to live a life of kind of luxury and travel. For the next several years, Sobraj continued to work odd jobs, all the while perfecting the art of deception. In 1970, Sobraj and Chantel's life took a dramatic turn when they left Paris and headed for India. Sobraj soon found a new target for his crimes, the young and gullible travelers on the hippie trail. 1970, Paris. 26-year-old Charles Sobrage has already served time in a French prison for car theft. Undeterred by his punishment, he continues a steady stream of crimes, like passing bad checks and robbing tourists. The robberies help him provide for his pregnant wife, Chantal. But Sobrage worries about getting caught and decides it would be safer for him to hit the road. Now, on the run, Sobrage takes his crimes to the next level. In the summer of 1970, he and his wife Chantal leave Paris and travel to Bombay, India. There, Chantal gives birth to a baby girl, Usha. During the next year, Sobraj runs a stolen car business. The money bankrolls a newfound passion for gambling. He had a very uh, serious gambling habit. He wanted to live in a high style. Sobraj loses more money than he wins. To support his family, he continues to rob tourists, but adds a new twist. He learns how to drug his targets. Not to kill them, but to befriend these tourists, to spike their drinks. They would become comatose. He would steal their belongings. He finds targets who are even easier than the typical tourists, Western backpackers on the hippie trail. These people, because they were uh, strangers in a strange land, presented uh, a particular vulnerability. People were friendly. They didn't ask a lot of hard questions. So they were very susceptible to con men like Charles Sobrage. He despises the hippies. They had long hair. They smoked marijuana. They'd had easy lives where he'd had a tough life. He didn't give a damn about these pampered Westerners. Sobrage finds it easy to spike their drinks. He seemed to just love to slip people drinks and they would luck out and work, wake up in a hotel room and go on with their lives. Remember, he is a gambler and he also gambled on the fact that no one in Asia at that time would care too much about long-haired, barefooted backpackers. And in a way, he was right about that. Sobrage doesn't always get away with his crimes. In 1971, he is arrested in India for a jewelry heist and ends up in prison. Sobraj begins plotting his escape. While in the Bombay prison infirmary, and with the help of his wife Chantal, he manages to drug a guard and breaks out. He and his wife are quickly captured. She posts bail, and he too is eventually freed on bail. 
They flee India in 1972, ending up in Kabul, Afghanistan. Sobraj continues his crime spree, drugging and robbing Western tourists on the hippie trail. In 1973, Sobraj and his wife Chantal are arrested and jailed in Kabul for failing to pay a hotel bill. Once again, Sobraj drugs a guard in the prison infirmary and escapes. That's part of his secret. And there's always going to be a time when the guards fall asleep or they're distracted or he may just smuggle a drug into the jail that he can, you know, put them to sleep. So Braj flees to Tehran, Iran, leaving his family behind. Once Chantal is freed on bail, she returns to France and is reunited with her two-year-old daughter, Usha. For the next year, so Braj is constantly on the move. He usually carries at least a dozen fake or stolen passports and always manages to stay one step ahead of the law. Sobraj moved easily across borders. Police officers don't do that. Sobraj spoke many languages and was masterful at covering his tracks and moving to another country before the authorities caught up with him. With his exotic looks and extensive language skills, he takes on different identities and even poses as a woman. Sobraj was unique in that he was a bit of a chameleon. He could be uh, Eastern, he could be Western, he could be French, he could be uh, Vietnamese. This facility to take on so many different persona is not something that you see very often at all. In 1974, just outside of Athens, Greece, Sobraj is arrested for another jewelry robbery. He's sent to Corridalis prison. No one had ever escaped from it before. And he made a very daring escape from that jail. It finally involved getting himself put into hospital. And when he was put into the police van to go back, Sabah started a fire in the, the police van. And they stopped the van and he just jumped out, pushed everyone aside, ran away. Over the years, Sobraj makes escapes in several countries. When I once said, how do you do it? some of the toughest security jails in the world. And his answer is really luminous. Sobraz said that the desire of the guards to keep me imprisoned is no match for my will to be free. The escapes help earn him a nickname, the Serpent. He was called the Serpent, I think mainly by the authorities so be because he had been able to slip away. He was sort of a, a slippery kind of character who was able to, to always get out of a jam. After his escape from prison in Greece, Sobraj is a changed man, empowered by the belief that he can do anything. And he is preparing to act out his darkest and most grisly fantasies. By 1975, 31-year-old Charles Sobraj is a career criminal. For more than a decade, he has pulled off scams, druggings, and robberies. He's also an escape artist who managed to break out of one of the toughest penitentiaries in Greece. He then travels to Bangkok, Thailand, where he rents a villa. Even though Sobraj is still married, he takes up with a woman he meets on his travels, a 29-year-old Canadian named Marie Leclerc. Captivated by his charisma and charm, Marie falls in love and quickly becomes his accomplice. She helps Sobraj by befriending tourists. Marie Leclerc uh, was very dedicated to him and stuck by his side uh, even when he was philandering with other women. The couple recruits another partner, a 22-year-old man from India named A.J. Chowdhury. He becomes Sobraj's right-hand man and obeys orders without question. Sobraj sometimes uses devious methods to get people to join his gang. He would take someone in and uh, slip poisons into uh, different foods that they would ingest. Uh, they would become sick. He would uh, tell them that it was dysentery. He would uh, help them back to health and at that point in time, they would be holding to him. 
With the help of his cohorts, Sobraj continues to con, drug, and rob hippies. It is at this point that Sobraj encounters 18-year-old American tourist Teresa Knowlton of Seattle, Washington. And his methods took a deadly turn. Teresa is on her way to study Buddhism at a Tibetan monastery. After Sobraj meets her, he becomes convinced she is a heroin user and smuggler. He tells her she is a hypocrite. So I say, you don't think that doing what you are doing is, uh, you know, you can harm human uh, uh, beings because it is harmful after all. The market will help you learn meditation, it's the respect of human beings, you know, doing In his interviews with author Richard Neville, Sobraj labels the Knowlton murder and the rest that followed as cleanings. I never killed good people, that's what he said. One reason why Sobraj confessed to the murders in such detail was because in a strange way, he was rather proud of them. One month after killing Teresa Knowlton, Vitali Hakim from Turkey becomes his next victim. Once the first murder was committed, then it, he sort of was almost like he was on a roll. From then on, what did he have to lose by killing? So Braj believes Hakim is also a drug smuggler and in the confession tapes brags about the murder. I uh, took one of his clothes I put on his face and I put gasoline on it. I started going running to the car because of course it would be a big uh, flame. And then, uh... While Thai police investigate the Hakim murder, so Braj takes pleasure in seeing his work in the headlines. He enjoys notoriety. I don't believe that Sobraj thought that he would be caught. Several weeks later, during a trip to Hong Kong, Sobraj meets his next victims. A young Dutch couple, Hank Batania and his fiancée Cornelia Hemker. Posing as a gem dealer, he talks the Dutch couple into buying a sapphire ring. He invites them to his villa in Bangkok, and they accept. Once there, Sobraj and his accomplice drug and rob the couple, then drive them to a remote location. There, they beat the pair and burn them alive. Within days, he murders a French woman named Stephanie Pari, who came to Bangkok looking for her boyfriend, Vitaly Hakim. He's killing because someone has gotten too close to him and he's afraid that they might go to law enforcement and uh, uh, give up his uh, criminal activities. Pari's body is found south of Pattaya Beach, where the body of Teresa Knowlton was discovered one month earlier. When reports of the bikini killings and the murders of the Dutch couple hit the newspapers in Thailand, Sobraj and his accomplices flee Thailand for Nepal. Sobraj uses the passport of one of his victims, Hank Batania. In Kathmandu, Sobraj meets Canadian Laurent Carrier and his American friend Connie Jo Bronzich. They ran into a uh, person who was describing himself as a gem dealer. And he had a girlfriend. And Connie had apparently gone back to their five-star hotel and had been shown a number of gems. He also tempted people with cheap gems, with tales of adventure, um, by offering, offering uh, uh, his potential victims nights in hotels. Connie is particularly drawn to Sabraj because of his claim to be a gem dealer. She was enchanted by this guy. Connie was in love with jewelry. She just um, was always telling the, the newly acquired friends in Nepal that she loved jewelry and she just wishes she had more money to spend on jewelry. Soon, Nepalese authorities will have a brutal double murder on their hands. It was apparently a particularly savage crime. Connie Joe's body was found severely stabbed, burnt beyond recognition. In late December 1975, 31-year-old Charles Sobraj is no longer just a con man and thief. He is also a cold-blooded killer, responsible for five murders in Thailand. There wasn't even a word for a serial killer at that stage. Didn't, the phrase didn't exist. That's how uncommon it was. Sobraj flees Bangkok and travels to Nepal with his two accomplices, girlfriend Marie Leclerc and Ajay Chowdhury. 
Sobraj and Leclerc use passports they stole from two of the murder victims. In Kathmandu, Sobraj poses as a gem dealer named Elaine Gauthier. He befriends American backpacker Connie Jo Bronzich and her companion, Laurent Carrier, a Canadian. Just days before Christmas, their bodies are found in Kathmandu. They have been beaten, stabbed, and set on fire. Nepalese authorities are shocked and outraged. That is very, very tough. That has not happened in Nepal before. Then the first target, we had to identify the body. The idea of, of Western tourists, Western backpackers being brutally stabbed really incensed the Nepalese, and they really wanted to find their killers. Friends of the victims tell police they saw the pair with a gem dealer named Alain Gauthier. Based on eyewitness descriptions, police bring in Sabraj and his girlfriend, Marie Leclerc, for questioning. They tell police they are on vacation from Holland and show authorities the passports of the Dutch couple they murdered in Thailand. He says, I'm Annika Sandy Belindinja. I'm from the Amsterdam, Holland. I'm professor. My wife is TV star. We looked to these passports. We couldn't find anything. Police don't have enough evidence to detain the couple, so they let them go. Still suspicious of the pair, Nepalese police keep their hotel under surveillance. When there's no sign of them after a day, authorities break into their room. So Braj and his two accomplices had managed to slip out of the hotel unnoticed. In the hotel room, police find a stash of stolen passports and other incriminating evidence, including business cards with the name Alain Gauthier and a Bangkok address. Now Nepalese authorities connect the dots after reading in the papers about the murder of a Dutch couple in Thailand. After a few days, we have the Bangkok Post here, and we noticed the name Henneke Sensbindinza. A lady died, murdered in Thailand. And we say, oh, this is the thing. It's the same Dutch name used by Sobraj when he was questioned a few days earlier. But by now, Sobraj is nowhere to be found. Back in Thailand, witnesses tell police of a gem dealer going by the name of Alain Gauthier, who was seen with the murdered tourists. In Sobraj's rented villa there, Authorities discover stolen passports and other documents linking Sobraj's alias, Alain Gauthier, to the crimes. By 1976, the story is all over the papers from Thailand and Nepal. Sobraj was a challenge to law enforcement at every level because he moved very freely, very uh, flexibly across international borders. After being questioned and nearly caught for the Nepal murders, Sabraj and his two accomplices flee to India. The best way he could keep moving was to change his identity, and for that he needed passports. January 1976, Varanasi, India. Sobraj and his accomplices befriend a 34-year-old Israeli scholar named Alan Jacobs. Soon after, Jacobs is found dead in his hotel room. He'd been poisoned. Sobraj, really, by this stage, by 1975, 1976, was capable of killing anyone uh, if it suited his convenience. No one has yet connected Charles Sobraj to any of the killings, so he is confident he can still avoid capture. He returns to Bangkok using Jacob's passport. At one point, Sobraj and his two partners are detained by police and questioned, but Sobraj bribes the Thai officers with $15,000, and they are released. The authorities were incompetent. They were unable to hold Sabraj and he escaped. He flew the coup. The trio now heads to Malaysia, where police believe Sabraj murders one of his accomplices, A.J. Chowdhury, after they commit a gemstone robbery. Chowdhury is never heard from again. They think that he killed this guy, A.J. He's not your classical serial killer, if you will. He is someone who likes to control his environment, control those around him. Sobraj and Leclerc leave Malaysia and return to India. There, Sobraj once again uses his charm to manipulate and recruit a 22-year-old Englishwoman, Barbara Smith, and 26-year-old Mary Ellen Ether of Australia. 
he convinces the women to steal passports and money. Charles Sobrage is reputed to be a charmer. The number of women who were uh, uh, dedicated to him uh, would, would certainly suggest that that's the case. By mid-May 1976, news about the killings is spreading across Asia and Europe. Police in several countries are investigating similar cases. Pictures of Sobraj, Leclerc and Chaudhry are splashed across the papers. But Sobraj is still being identified as gem dealer Alain Gauthier. On May 19th, an international arrest warrant is issued for Gauthier and his two accomplices. He is now the most wanted man in the world. In June, in Bombay, Sobraj and his crew befriend their next victim, a 28-year-old French tourist named Luke Solomon. A plan to drug and rob him goes awry when they accidentally give him an overdose and kill him. The team travels to New Delhi. It is here at the Vikram Hotel that Sobraj tries to drug and rob an entire group of French students. But the plan fails when the drug takes effect too quickly and students begin passing out in their hotel lobby. Police are called and Charles Sobraj is caught and finally identified. It is only a matter of time before his accomplices are rounded up, confessions are made, and the full story comes out. In 1977, an Indian court sentences Charles Sobraj to 11 years in prison. The charges included the murder of Luke Solomon and the drugging of the French students. His accomplice, Marie Leclerc, serves six years in prison, but is released in 1983 after being diagnosed with ovarian cancer. She dies in 1984. Barbara Smith and Mary Ellen Ether serve two years for their role in the student poisonings. While Sobraj serves his jail time in India, Authorities in several other countries begin building cases against him. If Sabraj is worried, he doesn't show it. In fact, while in prison, he manages to live like a king. 1977, India. 33-year-old Charles Sobraj is serving an 11-year sentence. The charges include killing one man and poisoning dozens of tourists. His crimes stretch across Asia and Europe. Sobraj is believed to be responsible for scores of druggings, robberies, and at least 20 murders. In most of the cases which are committed in the India, which are committed in the Thailand, and which are committed in Nepal, there are the same type of the modus operandi. Sobraj admits to at least seven of these murders during a series of audio taped interviews with Australian author Richard Neville in 1977. Neville says that Sabraj never seemed concerned about incriminating himself in his detailed confession. Sabraj never felt he would ever come to trial for these charges, because in his mind he could escape at any time he wanted. Still, Sabraj jokes to Neville that his statements might come back to haunt him. So Braj serves time in Tahar prison, one of India's toughest. Behind bars, he is a mass manipulator. He was able to uh, convince the authorities there to allow him things that would not be afforded to other prisoners. Now, this was not a harsh imprisonment as he was uh, treated uh, almost royally in, in prison. Fellow inmates refer to Sobraj as Sir Charles. Through blackmail and bribes, he obtains cell phones, a computer, and special food. And he's allowed unlimited visitors. While Sobraj sits in an Indian prison, authorities in Thailand build a case against him. They plan to extradite him after he completes his sentence and try him for the murders in Thailand. There, Sobraj could face the death penalty. To avoid extradition, Sobraj comes up with a plan to extend his prison term in India. On March 16, 1986, Sobraj puts that plan into motion by throwing himself a birthday party. Sobraj and fellow inmates invite guards to the celebration. They serve cakes, cookies, and fruit, laced with sedatives. When the guards pass out, 
Sabraj and his crew escape. He enjoys 22 days of freedom before he's recaptured by Indian police. Just as Sobraj had calculated, he's sentenced to 10 additional years. The extension helps him avoid extradition to Thailand. That's because the statute of limitations for murder in Thailand will expire before he's released. As a result, he'll never face trial in Thailand. 11 years later, on February 17, 1997, 52-year-old Charles Sobraj walks out of prison, a free man once again. Sobraj returns to France. In Paris, he enjoys the life of a celebrity as Asia's most notorious criminal. He hires an agent and grants interviews for a $5,000 fee. There's also money from book and movie deals. In one TV interview, he brags about how easy prison life was in India. Full freedom inside the jail. I did whatever I wanted. By now, his story about the murder of Teresa Knowlton in Thailand has changed, despite the taped confessions he made to author Richard Neville. I have never killed her, nor did I meet I met her. We'll have to see whether those tapes exist. For six years, Charles Sobraj lives the high life in France. Then, in 2003, he inexplicably returns to the scene of one of his most gruesome crimes, Nepal. The one place in the world where there is still two crimes unaccounted for and no stay of executions in the law. In other words, he can still be prosecuted. Sobraj is arrested in Kathmandu after being spotted in a casino by a photojournalist. The police, district police, they called me. I was happened to go and see whether the right person is the right person or not. 27 years after he slipped away, the Nepalese police finally have Sobraj in custody. Many wonder why he would return to a country where he could still be arrested. I don't believe that Sobraj thought that he would be caught. He probably felt like he could do this with, with impunity. Sobraj is accused of the grisly murders of two tourists, American Connie Jo Bronsich and Canadian Laurent Carrier. The charges in the Carrier case are dismissed for lack of evidence. In August 2004, the Kathmandu District Court finds Charles Sobraj guilty of the Bronsic murder. He is sentenced to life in prison. I am shocked to have it, uh, to have been, uh, to, uh, to get the conviction without trial. They didn't even call a single witness, nothing. The criminal reign of Charles Sobraj, the serpent, is over. Today, the hippie trail is far less traveled due to social and political changes. The spirit of that generation has also changed, due in part to the crimes of Charles Sobraj, who drugged, robbed, and murdered travelers along the way. Sobraj always thought that he was above certain things. He was above the, the hippie scum. He was above the cops who were trying to pursue him so that somehow he would be safe. And all of a sudden, he's not safe. He's locked up. Charles Sobraj is accused of having committed a great many crimes in a great many different countries. He has been a serial criminal throughout his life. I would hope that he's changed his ways, but uh, I don't think any of us believes the serpent has changed his ways. In the time he spent with Charles Sobraj, Author Richard Neville could find no sign of remorse. I question him uh, repeatedly about remorse. Why, why, why didn't he absolutely have some empathy with the victims and how their friends and their families and their loved ones might feel? And he said, look, I never killed good people. When you look deeper into Charles Sobraj, after knowing him for some time, and you're aware of the number of victims, the conclusion is obvious as to what drives him. And that is the fact that he's a psychopath. 